Good evening. May I ask the guests to take their seats? Alors, essaie de me passer le fil pour pas qu'il dépasse. On peut le mettre dans, la, dans le pantalon. Est-ce que l'ambassadeur est équipé C'est bon Le fil ne dépasse pas. Hein il est où ah, Si, il pendouille là. Ok. Bon, ça ira. Euh... Representatives of the Geneva government, representatives of the United Nations, 
excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first debate at the Humanitarium on the politics and ethics of humanitarian action, co-hosted by the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs and the International Committee of the Red Cross. My name is Bea van Hove, I am the head of the ICOC Visitor Service, and I welcome you this evening to the Humanitarium with inspired emotion. My colleagues and I, with the professional help of the architects, engineers, construction workers, and technical teams, have been rolling up our sleeves for many months to make the Humanitarium look like this. A venue with state-of-the-art equipment, sober and light furniture, perfect lighting, and a ceiling which gracefully represents the mountains, the plains, and the seas on a borderless world map. They have made it possible that we can come together in an inspiring environment that invites you to explore new ideas and solutions to respond to the needs of people caught up in armed conflict and other humanitarian crises. Before giving the floor to the Ambassador of Switzerland to the United Nations, His Excellency Alexandre Fazel, and to the President of the ICOC, Peter Maurer, let me take you through our program this evening. During the first part of this evening, we will ask our panelists to briefly present their main perspectives and messages so that we can leave time for the second part of the discussion and exchange with the audience. Vincent Bernard will moderate the debate. He is editor-in-chief of the International Review of the Red Cross and head of the unit in charge of the Humanitarium. To open the discussion, we have our colleagues from Islamic Relief in London, ICOC Somalia and MSF in Iraq to join us in the discussion and present their dilemmas. We will then open the floor to your questions and to the questions we receive online. The debate will be followed by a cocktail reception and we will invite you to have a look at the photo exhibit of the 150th anniversary of the ICRC. It is my pleasure now to give the floor to His Excellency Alexandre Fazel and wish you an inspiring evening. Monsieur le Président du Comité international de la Croix-Rouge, Monsieur le Directeur général de l'Office des Nations unies à Genève, Excellence, Madame la Conseillère d'État de la République et Canton de Genève, Monsieur le Haut-Commissaire des Nations unies, Madame la Commissaire européenne, Mesdames et Messieurs, permettez-moi d'abord d'exprimer mon grand plaisir d'être parmi vous ce soir pour cette cérémonie inaugurale et ensuite pour assister à ce panel qui sera, je le sens, très stimulant. Monsieur le Président, au nom de la Confédération suisse, je souhaite vous féliciter pour ce nouveau centre de conférence qui porte très bien son nom, l'Humanitarium. L'inauguration de cet espace, ici au siège du Comité international de la Croix-Rouge, revêt une importance toute particulière aux yeux de la communauté humanitaire, genevoise et internationale. Et la présence de vous tous, mesdames et messieurs, le prouve. En tant qu'État parti aux conventions de Genève, la Suisse s'engage à respecter et à faire respecter le droit international humanitaire. Elle a certainement une légitimité particulière en la matière en tant qu'État dépositaire des conventions de Genève. Notre pays possède une longue tradition humanitaire et il est également un acteur humanitaire engagé. Le gouvernement suisse accorde une place importante aux questions humanitaires dans sa politique étrangère. Ladies and gentlemen, the International Committee of the Red Cross, as a pillar of today's humanitarian landscape, is a key humanitarian partner for Switzerland and indeed the biggest recipient of Swiss humanitarian aid. The ICRC is shaping the debate on legal and policy issues related to the changing environment in which it operates, but also on the growing challenges the humanitarian landscape is facing nowadays. 
With this new conference and visitor center, the ICRC is further strengthening its capacities to act as a catalyst of the reflection on the current challenges. We therefore very much welcome the opening of the humanitarian in the midst of international and humanitarian Geneva, and we are confident it will help foster the conversation around the common challenges facing humanitarian action today. Humanitarian challenges are such that the debate on them cannot afford any limitations. Issues of growing concern, such as the complexity of the battlefield, the security of humanitarians, or the difficulty to secure and sustain access, compel us to seek innovative solutions. We trust that the ICRC will suffer no inhibitions regarding the issues it wishes to bring to the debate. In the context of an ever-changing humanitarian landscape, we are grateful to the ICRC to be as inclusive as it can in its engagement in order to take stock and to benefit from the perspective of its traditional partners as well as emerging actors. I would like once more to congratulate the ICRC on this wonderful achievement that is the humanitarian. This facility is both the symbol and a great tool for the intensifying dialogue and collaboration on humanitarian issues to which Switzerland is deeply committed. I look forward to an enlightening panel discussion and wish you a good evening. Je vous remercie. My two uh, uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, to welcome you all uh, this evening to uh, the humanitarian, the new ICRC venue that was given the name to immediately reveal its ambition. It's a place where one will be invited to explore ideas, to formulate concrete solutions, to better address current and foreseeable humanitarian issues. It will focus on ICRC's core business, the principle of humanity and therefore on the consequences of armed conflict and violence, but be open to address other humanitarian issues with other actors. The reference of the name is therefore with regard to laboratorium and not to aquarium. It's about exploration and not about introspection, just to be very clear and well understood. The ICRC wants to make the humanitarium a true venue where diplomatic, military, academic and humanitarian communities come together to exchange and explore different perspectives to inform our action. We clearly want to go beyond advocacy and generate ideas around concrete solutions. It will hopefully be an innovative and dynamic space, aiming at facilitating dialogue, understanding, cooperation amongst a variety of stakeholders, uh, in order to better address upcoming challenges. Our ambition is that the discussion in this space will be rooted in Geneva, but extend well beyond Geneva, via new communication technology and social media. It's a typical place for a kind of localism, rooted in the local community, but with a perspective for global action, or maybe the inverse form of localism, think locally and act globally. The humanitarian clearly represents an opportunity for the ICRC to listen, to learn, as well as to share its own experiences. ICRC's strategic aim is to have, uh, to be a convener of discussion here in Geneva and beyond. Over time, this will contribute to the capacity of ICRC to proactively bring issues of concern to the agenda and develop and maintain a global and consolidated network of contacts. Together with New York, Geneva is one of the most important hubs and points of international cooperation in the world. The UN office in Geneva uh, is the most active center for multilateral diplomacy in the world and has been the setting of many historic negotiations. We are happy to offer in this center a specific venue for modern humanitarianism. We're grateful to Switzerland as a host country to offer us such favorable conditions. We are grateful to the city and the canton of Geneva for the good cooperation and we are grateful first and foremost to all of you 
the partners within the Red Cross and the Red Crescent movement, with the UN communities, with the NGO, with the academia, to shape with us the debate in the future. Our culture at the ICRC is driven by action and rooted in the field, but we also know that there are times to take one step back and to reflect, and that's what we would like to do together with you uh, tonight. So, uh, Vincent Bernard will uh, uh, take over and guide us uh, through the evening, and I will uh, come back later. And uh, I should have said that at the beginning. Apologies for not having mentioned all the excellencies here present, but I think we have more interesting things to do than uh, to greet people. So, uh, Vincent, to you. Thank you. Well, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce this first debate at the Humanitarium on the ethics and politics of humanitarian action and to welcome our panelists this evening. I'm also very pleased to see in this room so many experienced colleagues uh, from the UN, from the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, from various humanitarian NGOs and academia based in Geneva and in the field. Let me also greet all those who are watching us online. The 150th anniversary of the ICRC represents an opportunity to reflect not only on the history of the organization, but the, on, on the involution of the humanitarian action and the humanitarian sector in general. So the overall concept for this event is to have an engaging discussion between the panelists, the field, and the audience on some of the key challenges that humanitarian actors and the international community in general is facing today. This discussion is taking place at a time when international attention is focusing on the humanitarian disaster in Syria. Syria exemplifies the tensions between the aspirations, the ambitions and principles of humanitarian action on the one hand, and on the other hand, the realities of the political environment in which humanitarian actors operate today. However, these tensions also manifest themselves in many other contexts where we work, such as Afghanistan, the DRC, Somalia. So the main purpose of our discussion this evening will be to explore these tensions and imagine solutions for the future. Three main dimensions will help help us frame uh, the discussion. First, we would like to look at the humanitarian needs, the risks, the vulnerabilities, not only the ones that we see today, but also the ones which are emerging. Second, we will look at the political environment in which humanitarian actors operate and the challenges to the compliance with humanitarian principles and with the law. And finally, we'll discuss the international challenges for the humanitarian sector itself, be they organizational or ethical. To discuss the above challenges, we have invited today four leading humanitarian action policy makers and thinkers. We have Kristalina Georgieva, the European Commissioner responsible for international cooperation, humanitarian aid and crisis response. Welcome. We have Antonio Guterres, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. You've just met Peter Maurer, the President of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And we have Dr. Mukesh Kapila, who is currently Professor of Global Health and Humanitarian Affairs at the University of Manchester. They come from various countries and backgrounds. They are trained as economists, engineer, historian and medical doctor and they bring a wealth of experiences in various sectors of society. Government, the World Bank, donor agencies, NGOs, the academic world. They regularly go to the field and to understand first and the needs of those uh, victims of conflicts and disasters. They are outspoken and they are genuinely engaged in favor of the humanitarian cause. So we think they are among the best places to discuss the issues at hand and make decisions that, sh that shape the way ahead. So we'll first give the floor to Commissioner Georgieva, who is visiting us today from Brussels. Following a distinguished career as an economist in her home country, Bulgaria, 
and then at the World Bank, Kristalina Georgieva became the first commissioner specifically appointed for humanitarian aid and crisis response in 2010. In this capacity, she is re responsible for the Directorate General for Humanitarian Aid and Civil Protection of the European Commission. Since she took up this position, she has been a dedicated champion of the humanitarian cause. Commissioner Georgieva, it's a real honor to have you here with us today. And I would like now immediately to jump to our discussion. The European Union is the world's biggest donor of humanitarian aid. Together, member states and the European institutions contribute more than half of the official global humanitarian aid. So, what is your reading of the current humanitarian environment? And how do you see the EU's responsibility in shaping the humanitarian agenda and, more generally, the humanitarian sector today? The floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, happy anniversary to ICRC. I'm a huge admirer and it is a tremendous honor to be part of the discussion today. There is yet to be a place w in the midst of humanitarian emergency I would visit where the ICRC delegates would not impress me. And uh, I am very humbled that you gave me the opportunity to be the first speaker. Um, it is not because I have more to say, but because, uh, Peter, you're also a gentleman. Ladies first. Thank you. Um, we are living in a world that is changing for the better and it is changing for the worse. In our humanitarian activities, change for, for the good is that it is a richer world and that means there are more donors that are bringing resources to help people in, in need. But it is also a more fragile world because of climate change. Natural disasters are more frequent and they are much more severe. And because of complexities in the world, very, very many conflicts are incredibly difficult for us as humanitarian uh, community, for the people affected by, by the crisis. We, I, I, I grew up, I lived during the times of the Cold War. We may not have a Cold War anymore, but the international landscape is complicated and there are some cold winds sometimes blowing because of economic reasons, cultural reasons, uh, pursuit of natural or regional interests. And in this world, it is absolutely essential that the humanitarian, the humanitarian community stands together, that we are clear on our foundation, on our principles, clear on our objectives, help people in the, their most dire moment of need, but also clear on our limitations and how we can overcome those. You ask me how the EU is facing our, how we are facing our role in this changing context. I am very privileged to be a humanitarian commissioner in the EU because, as you said, Europe continues to be most generous. 50% of humanitarian aid against 20%. This is our share in the world economy. But more important than the, the money is that we in Europe have achieved consensus on humanitarian aid based on the principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, independence. And we are determined to protect the neutrality, impartiality and independence of our humanitarian action. Because principles matter. Take Mali, a conflict that is now slipping out of the international attention, 
maybe because it is under the big shadow of Syria, maybe because things are getting a little better. But in the north of Mali, we would have had no presence if we didn't stick to these principles. Because we did, people's lives were saved, and now when there is a recovery, we can work towards restoration of basic services because we are there and the development people are, are, are not. Syria, I'm sure, would be repeatedly coming in this discussion. In Syria, whenever the danger of stepping into we will help you because you are on our side, when this danger appears, it is a horrible thing. In Syria, we see a precedent, dangerous precedent. I hope it would be, it would, it would be over, over, overcome. When the Security Council, the UN Security Council, for the first time in modern history, is unable to agree on a humanitarian resolution so far. Not in Rwanda, not in former Yugoslavia, not in Congo, we have faced a situation when the members of the Security Council cannot agree on two simple things. Can't, you cannot kill civilians, you cannot shoot at the people who are there to help them. Why? Mostly because of this tension that comes from, from, from politics uh, being being so dominant and so far harsh on reaching agreement on humanitarian grounds. There is a glimpse of hope in this city today and tomorrow. And I pray that it leads to, to durable solution, the only way to put an end to the suffering of people. But I also very much hope that we will bring the question of access on the basis of principles front and center as this glimpse of hope shines, hope, hopefully shines, continues to shine over us. Secondly, in the EU, we are recognizing that principles don't mean that we humanitarian, the humanitarian people live on, an, on another planet. We are on, on together, you know, we are not on Venus and the, uh, and the politi political people and development people on Mars. We are on the same planet. We need each other. But we need each other with clear recognition of, of our different mandates. We need the development people to build the foundation for peace and security in vulnerable countries. We need the politicians to take responsibility so in the Security Council they reach, reach, reach an agreement on, on Syria. And I think in the humanitarian community we must be open to reach out, depend, defend our mandate, but recognize that we need, need each other. Three, professionalism matters. And I'm not going to venture into that because I'm, I'm sure, sure others would, would talk about it. We are now creating EU Volunteer Corp. And we want to have a standard of, of preparedness of our people so when you reach out to our volunteers, you know that they are ready to do a particular task and what it is. Policies matter. For us in the EU, I want to frame three policies that are crucial for the future of our humanitarian action. First, focusing on resilience to natural disasters. As humanitarians, we must advocate for building the agility of communities so when a disaster hits, fewer people die and, and, and suffer. But similarly, we need to advocate for more work on conflict prevention and conflict resolution. Take Central African Republic. If we miss the boat now to step in, we will have another Somalia. It is in the making. And third, a, we work in the EU to have more anticipatory capacity, to see a crisis on the horizon, horizon before, before it hits. So we can actually act early, target the most vulnerable, and reduce the pain, pain and suffering. And actually, I would add one more. Fourth, that 
in the, in, the, in the EU, we also made a conscious choice to set aside 15% of our budget for forgotten crises. Because the long shadows of things like Syria lead to vulnerable people in, other, in the Central African republics, or in Chad, or in the Sahel, to, lose, to not get help and to lose hope in, in their future. Let me finish with a very strong statement on where the EU is going to be. Ten years down the road, I will be long forgotten, long gone as commissioner. I actually am a very strong believer in the future of the European Union as a force for good, as a force for peace. Ours is a young union. We are only 64 years in our history. The US, 64 years in their history, had California and Texas out, different currencies in our states, and the civil war was ahead of them, not behind. I do, I do believe that Europe is going to continue on this way of integration, but also would, 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 would stick to its conscious commitment to be a soft power, to be a force for good. How do I know it? Well, our people tell me so. We have asked the Europeans in 2010 and then in 2012, do they support funding humanitarian action? Well, in the middle of our worst crisis in history, support in Europe has gone up from 78 to 89%. And now we got our budget for the next uh, seven years. The budget went down, but the humanitarian part of it went up. So I, I finish with this. We are committed to play our role in funding, but also in policies, and making sure that the world of our children is a more secure, better world. Thank you. And two. Sorry, it's better with the mic on. Uh, we know that you are very active at the moment to mobilize international support uh, for the refugees flowing out of Syria. Um, we know also that you are not only a, a seasoned politician and strategist, but also a very committed to the humanitarian cause. Mr. High Commissioner, we have heard from Commissioner Georgieva how she envisions the role of the European Union and the responsibility of a major donor in shaping the humanitarian agenda. So I'd like to turn to you now and ask you a question. From the perspective of the UNHCR, can you please give us your reading of the main humanitarian problems we are facing today? And how do they affect the capacity of the humanitarian sector to respond? The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, first of all, Peter, let me tell you how, how happy I am that you invited me to be part of this uh, say historic moment, 150 years, in the life of the humanitarian organization for which I have the strongest feelings of admiration, of love, and envy. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay. As a matter of fact, I'm an electrical engineer. But <laughs> <laughs> it's okay? It's okay? Well, I, uh, I think the message uh, uh, can be easily uh, uh, expressed. We are facing growing humanitarian needs. We are facing them 
without having the resources and the capacity to adequately respond to them. And we are facing them in an environment that is becoming more complex and with challenges in the response that make it not only more complex, but more dangerous in many parts of the world. First, growing humanitarian needs. We are witnessing a multiplication of new conflicts. Just look at the last two years. And at the same time, we have the impression that old conflicts never die. Just look at Somalia or Afghanistan and many others. And this puts an enormous pressure on uh, the humanitarian world. Now, uh, the truth is that the, the, the international community today has a limited capacity to prevent conflicts and to have a timely solution of those conflicts. Uh, Kristalina and I were born in the uh, Cold War times, uh, bipolar world. Then we lived a unipolar world. I'm not saying that those were good things, but at least there was a clear set of power relations. Today, we are not yet in a multipolar world, no longer in a unipolar or bipolar. It's a kind of transition that is messy, but there is not a clear set of power relations. So unpredictability became the name of the game. We don't know where the next crisis will emerge. And the capacity of the international community is considerably limited in order to be able to avoid and to solve the conflicts we are witnessing. At the same time, if one looks at the combination of the different megatrends of today's world, climate change, and I fully agree, probably the defining question of our times, but also population growth, urbanization, uh, water scarcity, food insecurity, and if we see how all these things combine with each other, the fact is that they are generating in a smaller and smaller world more and more natural disasters, but also the slow onset of the degradation of environment in more and more areas of the world, which means more humanitarian needs and a bigger difficulty to respond to them. At the same time, if one looks at the budgetary perspectives of states all around the world, we see that traditional donors are facing very difficult budgetary situations. And we also see that emerging donors are slowly coming. They are coming, but slowly which means that very probably we will not be able to have, as we do not have today, enough resources and enough capacities to respond adequately to these growing needs in uh, the humanitarian panorama that we face. But that panorama is also more complex. We no longer have wars between two states or a, a clear conflict between a government and a rebel group. More and more we face scenarios where we have national armies, sometimes international forces, different militias, being them political, ethnic, or religious, bandits going around, and all this creating an environment where the insecurity is much bigger, the predictability is also much smaller, and the difficulty to respond, and the difficulty to have access to the people in need uh, are also uh, growing. And this puts us uh, sometimes in very difficult situations to, to decide what to do. Uh, namely, when we are present uh, in the context being in a UN agency, where we have peacekeeping forces, but there is no peace to keep. Where peacekeepers become with mandates that are not adequate in relation to the situations, sometimes parties to the conflict. And when the distinction between the military, the political, and the humanitarian presence of the international community as a whole becomes blurred. And so it's very easy also for us to be perceived by uh, populations or by groups uh, as part of the enemy or uh, linked to uh, those forces that they consider negative in the context of their own options or of uh, uh, their own situations. And here, I think the, the key question is how to preserve the autonomy of the humanitarian space in this complex environment, especially when the trend in the UN is a trend for integration. And uh, it is absolutely essential when this trend for integration takes place to make sure that things uh, are conducted in a way that the humanitarian space as such is preserved and that humanitarian agencies can abide by the humanitarian principles that were mentioned by Kristalina of uh, impartiality, neutrality, and uh, independence. But more and more complex and in some insecure environments, more and more difficult. And sometimes we will have to face, and we will be facing it more and more, the need to decide whether we can act in an environment 
or whether to be loyal to our principles, we have to abandon it. And what recently happened to Médecins Sans Frontières in Somalia is a good example reminding us of the challenges we are facing because of the complexity and the dangers of the situations we face. Now, uh, in this pessimistic or uh, worrying panorama, I think there is a key element of response. And that key element of response is partnership. There is no way we can do it alone. And more and more we need to work together, but work together in the respect of the independent nature of mandates, and namely, uh, we are at the ICRC, the independent nature of the ICRC <coughs> mandate, uh, an organization with, which, with whom we very much enjoy to work with, but always remembering that you have a very special mandate that needs to be respected, because if not, you will not be able to deliver according to the principles that have originated you 150,000 years, 150 years ago, uh, with this, all these millions that I face. <laughs> uh, and so, partnerships. And obviously, making the three pillars of the humanitarian community, the Red Cross, Red Crescent Pillar, the civil society, NGO movement, and the UN agencies working better and better together, respecting the mandates, but being able to coordinate their action, not uh, uh, as a uh, ideological concept, but uh, as something that is needed to make sure that delivery to the people we care for uh, is improved. And let's not forget that in the middle of all these conceptual discussions, the most important thing is the people we care for. And it is in the respect for the needs and the rights, especially the rights of the people, that we have to find the right options or to find solution, the, the, the right solutions uh, in the complex options that we face. Well, thank you, sir, for this uh, overview, this amazing overview in, uh, in less than 10 minutes of the challenges and some of the uh, way ahead. Um, I would like now to introduce our next speaker, Peter Maurer, the president of the ICRC. Many of you here in Geneva are familiar with him. Before joining the ICRC, Peter Maurer has held various positions in Bern, Pretoria and New York, where he was ambassador and permanent representative of Switzerland to the United Nations. In 2010, he was appointed Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs for Switzerland. He became ICRC president on 1st of July 2012, and since then, he has been um, extremely active in visiting the places of conflicts, of wars in the world, the different crisis situations. I'd like also to take this opportunity to salute one of his predecessors, President Cornelio Somaruga, who is with us this evening. You're most welcome. <laughs> President Morer, we've heard remarks about the emerging trends in terms of humanitarian issues and some of the tensions between the humanitarian mission and the environment in which it operates. So I'd like to ask you the question, how does an independent, impartial and neutral actor such as the ICRC navigate through these increasingly complex environments? And in very concrete terms, how do you address those dilemmas and tensions? So the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Vincent, and uh, needless to say, thanks, uh, Cristalina and uh, Antonio for, uh, for being with us tonight. Uh, just to uh, echo what uh, both of you said beforehand, I think it's, uh, it's evident that we are confronted with a big transformation in our international environment and that humanitarian needs are growing. Now, uh, when I think about uh, Vincent's questions on uh, what are the challenges on the ground, I'm tempted to respond to a question with a question or with questions because first it is easier to respond, uh, to, to ask a question than to respond. And, uh, and secondly, also on a more serious tone, asking the right question is maybe half the answer uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we will have to find. Let me just, uh, in form of question, give you a sense on what the changing environment puts in front of us as challenges. 
many of my colleagues uh, on the ground have to ask themselves each and every day the question, what risks can we take in our operations and how do we ponder the interest of accessing to populations in need against the interest of uh, keeping alive as humanitarian workers. This is daily reality in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Somalia, in many other places. How do we engage with states using sovereignty to shield the population from independent humanitarian aid rather than to promote uh, the access to populations in need? How do we engage with armed groups, in particular armed groups, non-state actors, which uh, are considered uh, criminals or terrorists by large parts of the international community? How do we manage the possible discrepancy between our needs assessments, because independent humanitarianism is basically based on needs assessment on the one side, and the attention and visibility and money flows which go to certain conflicts and not to others. How do we manage expectations to focus on short-term relief? I'm always surprised how many of our donors think that uh, we should quickly fix a problem and uh, are surprised to find us in protracted situations. Antonio has said they don't go away, those conflicts, for, for many decades. How, how do we manage uh, the marriage of short-term versus long-term attention? I just come back from Korea, where uh, we discuss missing and family reunification 60 years after the war. Uh, I could mention many other conflicts. We have seen uh, Mali and our engagement in the north of Mali uh, last year, the second part of last year, where we were only able to mount an important humanitarian operation because we have been 10 years before in Mali. And we had a network on which to build and to create uh, a, a rapid response and, and, and to build it up. So how do we manage the fact that uh, actually in order to respond quickly and rapidly, we need long-term uh, engagement. How do we manage the fact that in many of our approaches, we focus on the individuals, the civilians, the detainees, the wounded and sick individual is at the center of our attention. And on the other hand, we are increasingly solicited by countries for advice on how to build justice systems because we are active in, in prisons. So how do we manage the requests coming towards a, a humanitarian actor for, on the one side, individual attention and system, systemic counseling? There are many questions and challenges in front of us. In uh, 150 years, or not yet 150,000 years, we have nevertheless learned a couple of things. And here I try to to give very simple responses. What have we actually learned as being a little bit more successful than other things, while I don't want to pretend that is the only thing one can learn? To build humanitarian action close to needs and close to victims and to scale up bottom up and not to pour humanitarian programs top down uh, onto, onto crisis situations. Maybe uh, always to reflect to promote cooperative security arrangements rather than military securitization of uh, humanitarian action. To engage as a priority on confidentiality in particular in very, some of the very delicate issues like detention, conduct of hostilities. That the first step must be confidential engagement uh, and, and patience in confidential engagement before we would go public uh, with our dissatisfaction on criticism. To prepare for large-scale response in humanitarian urgency, it's important to be ready when large-scale emergencies happen, to provide food, elementary household items, water, sanitation, health, but also to keep the flexibility to respond to very specific questions and situations and contexts. I was very much surprised when colleagues told me that in Gaza, uh, for instance, uh, during the last uh, uh, Israeli intervention in Gaza, uh, we thought that the population would need medicine and, and health. 
but we found out they want fuel in order to uh, uh, provide fuel to generators in order to load cell phones. Uh, we have uh, to be flexible to respond to context and, and needs in specific contexts and not to, s to treat each and every crisis one size fits all. I join Antonio when he said that partnership is a, is a big word. I think uh, we need to build coalitions around mutual, impartial and independent humanitarian action today in response to humanitarian crises. Uh, we are the first ones to recognize today that we can't stem it alone, that we have to work much more closely with our movement partners, with the national societies, with the Federation, but also beyond with other NGOs and UN agencies which are committed to neutral, impartial and independent humanitarian action. So there is uh, maybe not recipes, but some approaches uh, uh, that are important to learn from our, from our experiences. Each and every one of us here in the room has his own truth and that's the whole reason for the debates we are, uh, we are having. If I may propose three things which seem to me today particularly important in order to strengthen humanitarian uh, response in, in a partnership logic, it's uh, to strengthen professionalism. I think we cannot deal with the complexity of the issues if we do not, uh, in a very targeted and systematic way, train our people to deal with those complexities in a, in a very professional way. I think we have to promote deliberately innovation in humanitarian action because challenges with which we are confronted are not uh, challenges we, to which we can respond with standard operation procedures. So we have to promote deliberately innovative uh, responses and tools uh, with regard to the increasing uh, challenges with which we are confronted. And we need new types of partnerships I have alluded to. If uh, I can stop here maybe with a last, uh, with a last comment, and it uh, will sound extremely old-fashioned, what I'm saying. But uh, you have been invited tonight uh, for a debate on uh, ethics and politics of, humanitarian, of humanitarianism, of humanitarian action. And I ask myself, what kind of ethics and values do we need with persons in order to deal with some of those challenges? And again, uh, I take the liberty of being very old-fashioned. I think we need courage rather than caution. We need compassion and proximity combined with professionalism. We need a spirit of innovation to deal with the new dimension and qualities of problems. We need a sense of collective responsibilities. That's what Antonio and Kristalina mentioned beforehand, with respect of each other's mandate, but at the same time with a sense of collective responsibilities towards vict victims. And probably we need more truthfulness and accuracy in how we communicate. This is, uh, I think, uh, Sounds very old-fashioned, but in terms of value and ethics uh, in today's world, may be important. I'll stop it here and uh, look forward to the continuation of the debate. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, President Moore, uh, for your invitation, for courage, compassion, innovation, responsibility. Accuracy. Um, now we move on to our last panelist, Mukesh Kapila, who is Professor of Global Health and Humanitarian Affairs at the University of Manchester. Well, behind this title of Professor, actually, you find a humanitarian veteran. Professor Kapila trained as a medical doctor, but he also worked at the UK Department for International De Development and he held senior functions at the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Professor Kapila worked in many crisis situations, such as Iraq, Rwanda, Bosnia, Afghanistan, or Sierra Leone. His recent book, 
against the tide of evil is a personal account of the dilemmas that he faced during his term as United Nations resident and humanitarian coordinator for the Sudan. So, Professor Kapila, based on what you've heard from the panelists so far, can you formulate a constructive critique of the architecture of the humanitarian sector? We have heard about the humanitarian problems, about the principles, about the political environment in which we operate. What is also your vision for possible changes for the humanitarian sector to better deliver? Thank you. Thank you. I hate this. I mean, you know, with such distinguished people, uh, how come I always get this job in panels? I have to be the kind of critical person, uh, really, to try and find uh, some thing to say which would be contrary to what these wise and distinguished people have said. But I'll try. This is a panel on uh, ethics and politics of humanitarian action. But why are many of us so uneasy when it comes to associating the word humanitarian with the word politics? As we commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Red Cross, remember please, that's older than the countries of their excellencies, most ambassadors of independent countries represented in this room. And it's older than the European Union, and that's older than the United Nations. Let's recall that Henry Dunan, the founder of the Red Cross, was a master practitioner of the political arts. It is thanks to his consummate political skills that this pioneering humanitarian movement hosting us today came into being. Humanitarianism started with politics. But humanitarians keep running away from politics on the spurious fear that the nobility of their thoughts and the purity of their actions may get tainted. And yet we know that the causes and consequences of the vulnerability that drives humanitarian action are largely of a political nature and require politically mediated solutions. If you go back in history, the feature that distinguishes the humanitarian movement from just charity or just philanthropy is politics. All the great humanitarian advances, for example, the abolition of slavery, the treatment of the mentally ill, countering the brutality of criminal punishments or the subjugated status of women, and moderating the brutality of war were born from the humanitarian womb, but they were political in their genesis. In fact, all the greatest humanitarians in history, in every culture and in every epoch, were above all politicians. It is their politics that drove them to become humanitarians and not the other way around. Maybe that's why Prime Minister Guterres became High Commissioner Guterres. Thus, as we look forward to the ever greater, more complex and interlinked challenges facing humanity, it is clear that we will need even more politics of the right sort, of course, to steer us our way through them. It is through politics that societies interact internally and with other societies to solve problems and figure out how to get along with each other. And as the world gets more democratized and globalized, more and more people demand to be involved in shaping the forces that affect their lives. Thus, in a wider sense, everyone is getting more political. So how come humanitarians want exemption from that? How come humanitarians want to be seen as non-political? What gives them the license not to, be, not to be political? Why are they afraid? Why do they run away? So I say, bring even more genuine politics, and emphasis on the word genuine, into the humanitarian enterprise and make it more central and more explicit. Not hidden, not underground, not in the corridors, but right at the center of modern humanitarianism. Turning now to some reflections on the prevalent humanitarian business model, which is what you wanted me to be critical about. Now, at its simplest, this is quite familiar to us. The humanitarian model is all about organizing in the best possible way to help all suffering people, but each according to their particular needs. So through most of history, the humanitarian endeavor has been largely geared towards achieving four objectives, gaining access, defining needs, organizing delivery, and of course, mobilizing resources to do so. However, 
It is a law of nature that simple forms can't survive. They get eaten up by others. Hence the inexorable momentum towards complexity. So it is with the humanitarian business model. It has had to evolve, and the pace of evolution has speeded up over recent decades. There have been three strategic drivers of change in the humanitarian business model. Firstly, the shocks from new types of severe man-made crises and so-called natural disasters, especially as today's crises are multi-dimensional impacts. Second is a stimulus of education, turning more and more people from passively grateful recipients of relief to discerning consumers of services. Thirdly, the disruption of science and technology at all levels. Of course, there are also many other phenomena, such as demographic shifts, uh, migration, urbanization. But in my view, these are not drivers of change. They are the consequences of more fundamental trends. In practical terms, the critical change drivers are being manifested in a range of behavior shifts that deform or reform, depending on your outlook, our original simple humanitarian business model. First, is the increasing focus of funders demanding the demonstration of concrete results from so-called humanitarian investments. It is a matter of regret that it is no longer enough to express compassion, but that it must be put into metrics. Often these metrics are of the reductionist kind that quantifies humanitarian uh, work, but does not value quantification. Uh, sorry, does not value compassion. Second is the increasing demand for the professionalization of humanitarian workers. Here I have to be slightly critical. I mean, and I'm supposed, and I'm a, and I'm a professor, so I'm supposed to be, you know, this is my bread and butter. I'm supposed to argue for more training and such like. Um, second is the increasing demand for the professionalization of humanitarian workers. It is sad that the innate instinct to help present in all human beings is no longer enough, but must be polished and certificated and validated through training. Third is expansion of the coordination industry. I think the diplomatic phrase is partnership, uh, which you mentioned, but I'm, my job is to be critical. Third is the expansion of the coordination industry. It seems that doing good where one can, often quietly and humbly, is insufficient nowadays. Today, one has to be seen to be, do, to be doing good, networked and connected with the good done by others. Fourth is the rise of the regulation culture. Greater accountability and transparency are demanded from humanitarian actors because trust has eroded. The current debate is between those with a policing mindset driving top-down driving top compliance and others with a more developmental mindset driving up standards. This is the difference between efficiency being seen as a lubricant of bureaucracy or a moral value. I know which side I'm on. Fifth. And as a consequence of the above factors is the increase in transaction costs of doing humanitarian work and the rise of what we may call the humanitarian corporation. Complete with jealously preserved brand identity and placement, these are transnational bodies in varying formation. Some are franchising operations, while others are conglomerates with a holding company and many subsidiaries. Others still are vertically integrated enterprises with impressive practical capabilities. They may include private sector profit-making enterprises. Monopolistic behavior by humanitarian corporations is not uncommon in the pursuit of gaining greater market share of the business of misery alleviation. Compassion has thus become big business, needing the latest in business school insights for successful running. Sixth, and unsurprisingly, is the inevitable growth of competition amongst humanitarian actors, the, the reverse of partnerships. Competition may be good for better grades at school or winning medals at Olympics, but having witnessed so much of the dysfunctional consequences of competition, I have serious doubts that it results in better humanitarian delivery. Now, this critique is uh, through a somewhat northern lens. A wider worldview would also highlight three other trends, and some of these have been mentioned. First is a co-option of humanitarianism into broader, multi-objective ambitions, such that humanitarianism nowadays is integrated into the human security paradigm with emphasis more on security than on human. Second are the, chain, are the challenges to fundamental humanitarian principles as we, as we know them, from the varying perspectives of other cultures. 
The debate here is not about humanitarian values on which there is remarkable consensus everywhere, but on their primacy, especially in the context of parallel and equally valid demands for justice, fairness, and human rights. Third is the reordering of institutional relationships between global and national actors as local capacities become better developed with consequent impacts on the redistribution of influence and power. This disrupts old patron-client relationships, donors, recipients, uh, NGOs in the northern countries, developing NGOs, and is not necessarily welcomed by everyone. In summary then, the humanitarian business model is seriously stressed, not just fraying at its edges, but also hollowing at its core. Where does all this leave us on the ethics and politics of humanitarian action, the subject of our panel? I submit that these will require a new dispensation through new trust that will have to be earned rather than imposed by regulation. If Dunant was here, he might have advised that humanitarianism cannot be reduced to a business or turned into a sector. He may have gone on to say, if we curb the humanitarian spirit that is innate in everyone by over-professionalizing, over-managing, and over-regulating it, it will shrivel and humanity itself will be the loser. The job of humanitarian leadership, therefore, is to ensure that this does not happen, even as the organization of the humanitarian corporation must be modernized and must go from strength to strength. I'm confident that my colleagues here, distinguished humanitarian leaders of some of our most respected global institutions, the EU, the UNHCR, and ICRC, will continue to have plenty of good work to do in the future. But what business they may be running could well be up for grabs. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kapila. I, I see already several tensions between ethics and, and politics in what we've been discussing so far, and I don't want to list all of them, but I can, I can already list a few of them. We discussed about development and humanitarian action and the long-term crisis we face and the need for development actors to come, but sometimes, well, they are not there. We discussed about the growing needs due to uh, increasing uh, disasters linked to climate change or to the persistence of some armed conflicts, but at the same time, restricted access on the ground and possibly problems of fundings, which may not sustain um, po possibly the growth of, of the response which we can anticipate in the future. We discussed the tension between our principles and our capacity to have access. Uh, but finally, Mukesh, you came with a proposal to reconcile humanitarian action and politics in a way, or to have humanitarian actors better assume their political dimension. And then highlighting different other tensions. Um, I understand also the question through, through your, your, your presentation of the accountability. To whom should humanitarian actors be accountable? Are they more accountable today towards beneficiaries who can express themselves through social media, for instance, and can better communicate? Um, or is it to donors? And then you raise a series of questions about the difficulty to put compassion into matrix, uh, which is also linked to the professionalization um, and the structure of the current humanitarian system or sector. As we see also that independence of the various actors is something on which you have insisted all, so we can certainly not speak about the system, but certainly about uh, a sector in which you have all these autonomous independent actors. Well, you have also identified the need for them to enter into partnerships and better coordination. So these are already a lot of topics to discuss. So before we move to uh, the following parts, I'd like to give you a chance to respond to each other quickly. We can take a few minutes if you want to discuss the points which have been raised uh, and then we will move to uh, um, the next uh, part of the evening.
to start and then will come true. Well, uh, I'm, I'm tempted to respond to, to some of the points Mukesh uh, has brought forward. And, and maybe I just pick uh, one or two. Uh, with regard to, to, to politics, I, I think, uh, Mukesh, the sort of <coughs> non-political label and attempts or what you said, running away from politics has proven an extremely efficient way of operating humanitarian action on the ground. So it is definitely a, a, a model tested because it allows you to gain access in situation if you try to compress some elements of humanitarianism as non-political and and therefore keep them out of ungenuine politics. At the same time, I think I just had a conversation with Kristalina beforehand. Uh, I think we are the first ones at ICRC to recognize that our ability to act depends on the political framework that states and high contracting parties of the Geneva Conventions offer. And that's the reason why in the concrete case of Syria today, we are calling to the members of the Security Council, to the international community, to use political influence and pressure in order to create the space mm -hmm. which is free of politics and open to impartial and independent humanitarian action. So I would like to correct the idea that we are running away from politics. We are not. Uh, I would just respond, neutral, impartial and independent humanitarian spaces have proven an, uh, an, an enormously uh, successful model of helping people in need. And by far do we not run away from political engagement. We know that all what we are doing depends on the framework which politics offers to us. And when the framework shrinks or is becoming in existence, we have to call on the high contracting parties in order to have politics unfold to give us back the space we need to do work. I think I'll stop it here because otherwise uh, the others uh, have not. But uh, I, would, I, I would love to talk for hours on, on Mukesh's point. <laughs> Thank well, you, madam. Uh, I, would take, I would take from this uh, uh, point and give you a very concrete example of this relation between humanitarian action and political and other and development action in the eu we have an ongoing discussion on a comprehensive approach to crisis and in this discussion we came <coughs> from the humanitarian uh, side with a very clear i think definition of where we belong and it is we are in but out. We are in because in a crisis uh, situation we, we want to understand the context and we have sometimes uh, useful uh, recommendations uh, 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 to make. And we want the political action to be such that it opens up more space for help to get to those who so much need it. But we are out because our own decisions are for us to make. And we drive these decisions only on the basis of two considerations. Are the needs profound? Do we have access to satisfy these needs? We are blind for which side of the conflict you are. We are blind. What is your religion? We are blind. What is the color of your, your skin? But you suffer and we can help. That is all that drives our decision. And I think we have to be honest about it, that, that we, yes, it, what, what happens in the Security Council matters. Whether the Security Council takes action 
to strengthen security in the, in the uh, Central African Republic matters to whether we can help more people. It matters. But with the same token, it is not politics and it is not the politicians that make decisions for how we operate. And we have to keep our, our operating environment really clean of politics because politics pollutes it. I mean, let's be very clear about it. Once we start saying, oh, you know, okay, let's see, are you with us? Do we like you? When we make these decisions, then you would be out of the north of Mali. You would be out of Kagabandoro in, in, in the Central African Republic, where, by the way, everybody was gone but ICRC. ICRC is there, still there. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I feel very strongly that we, on this, in this debate they, that in <coughs> but out is absolutely uh, paramount. And if I, if I, you know, the second point I want to make is uh, I was listening uh, to the old-fashioned uh, uh, better. And this year I turned 60, so I have the right to be old-fashioned myself. If I am to shrink everything I have learned, facing dramatic tragedies in destitute places. It would be the following. Goodness is quiet, cruelty is loud. We, as humanitarian community, have a responsibility to amplify kindness, to amplify goodness, to actually plea for the hearts Plea for empathy. Because if we don't do so, I really worry that the voices of anger and extremism, they would be the voices heard. So my message to, to everybody who cares about those who suffer, it, speak up, raise your voice. Make it hurt, because in the world we live today, where needs are going like this and resources are here, we need the voices of kindness to be much stronger. Thank you very much, Madam. If I'm you, you would like to take a yeah. yeah. No, uh, first of all, um, uh, Professor Capilla made a, a lot of very interesting comments from also the organizational point of view. And um, contrary to what he might think, I must say that I am in full agreement with the philosophy behind. Probably I would have some <laughs> details to discuss, but the philosophy behind, I think, is uh, adequate and it, it will be very important for all those that are involved in humanitarian action today to have a critical look about what you are doing and to take into account those observations because I think they are very important to take into account. But. I mean, as I've been in politics most of my life, it's normal that I also pick the political uh, aspect, uh, which, of course, is in the title of our conference. Uh, first, first, a personal dimension and then an institutional dimension. Um, first, uh, I started um, my active life uh, as a university student involved in a Catholic movement. And uh, I started with something that some might call charity, some might call humanitarianism, but it was work in the slums of Lisbon. And that is the reason why I didn't become a researcher in physics and I got involved in politics. Because at a certain moment, I felt that just to be uh, working in the slums of Lisbon to help some people do uh, some things was not enough. And my country was at the time a dictatorship with uh, lots of problems, as you know. And so, obviously, uh, the idea that the political engagement is the solution for uh, um, the problems we were facing in our humanitarian action um, has driven me to, uh, to politics. And I've been in politics for most of my life. But I also discovered at a certain moment of my life that there are some limitations in political action. And that at a certain moment, one needs to understand that, uh, I mean, the first way to rescue humanity is to start rescuing individual people. Um, and uh, uh, sometimes in politics... Uh, you really are, uh, especially in modern politics, involved in such a network of problems and uh, interests and uh, that your capacity really to, to rescue the world is much more limited than what you might think. And you start valuing more what you were doing when you were young. 
with individual people. And, uh, uh, and that is why at a certain moment of my life I decided that it was time to go back. It was not, I mean, not to run out, but uh, to go back uh, to the origins and, and to try to do it in another scale, in another way. And I think both things are very important. Now, institutionally speaking, I think we need to have the humility to recognize that there is no humanitarian solution for the problems we face. The solution is political. And it's very clear that uh, we are giving some painkillers to people. Mm. And we are minimizing the suffering of people, but we are not solving mm. the problems of people. The solution is political. and needs to involve the political actors. And to a certain extent, everything we do is also political. To a certain extent, everything we do is also political. And uh, it, it has an impact that also sometimes has uh, political dimensions. What I think is very important is, especially when we act in the, in the uh, troubled areas where this problem is relevant, in conflict areas, what I think is very important is to be able in our action in those conflict areas to preserve the impartiality, the neutrality, mm -hmm. and the independence of our action. An example, Eastern DRC today. The Security Council condemned the M23 and applied sanctions to the M23. It's a political decision. And there is a UN force that is supposed to uh, help the Congolese army to fight the M23, and that is even an inter has even an intervention brigade that is uh, supposed to, if necessary, intervene. And recently, they, as you know, uh, were part of a military operation against the M23. That is one dimension. Now, we are supposed to be able to help people both in government-controlled areas and in M23-controlled mm -hmm. areas. So we need to be able to talk to the government and to the M23. And in this conflict, independently of our opinion and who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, and probably all guys are good and bad, and this is much more complex than what people or think, we need to be able to talk to everybody and mm -hmm. to act based on the needs of people independently of where they are. <coughs> That is not always possible. There are areas in the world where they no longer have access. And there are some actors that do not even want to talk to us. Um, uh, but our not being naive about uh, um, these things, our obligation is to try to access everybody, wherever they are, whoever is in charge of them. And because of that, we need to be able to talk to everybody. And then there is something we need to be very cautious about, is those that have political responsibilities when they are not able to deliver politically, sometimes they discover the humanitarian. Yes. <laughs> and that is where the big risks are. Because then the risk is to try to instrumentalize humanitarian action mm -hmm. at the service of some specific political agendas. And this is what we also need to be very careful about. Yep. And if necessary, to um, make a clear separation and a clear distinction. The word humanitarian does not necessarily mean that Everything called humanitarian is truly humanitarian. Thank you very much. Um, I know that you, we could continue, and I, I hope that Mukesh will then have a chance to reply. But I suggest now we move to the second part of our conversation this evening. We will go back to the points you just raised, and you added the question of the instrumentalization of humanitarian action to, to these tensions I listed. Um, I will also give you the possibility to comment and react to what the panelists just said. But before doing that, we have selected three impor important <coughs> questions to ask them. Uh, there are concrete questions that we face in the field today. And these questions come from people with significant humanitarian experience. Two of them will join us uh, through Skype, and the third one is with us. So the first question is related to the growing diversity of the humanitarian sector and will be asked by Jahangir Malik, the director of Islamic Relief UK. So I think we, we can see you, Isla Jahangir. Do you hear us? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. So I think we need to, to possibly increase the volume in the room. The second oh. issue will be about the burning issue of access and we will ask Patrick Vial the ICRC's head of delegation for Somalia, who is present with us here at the Humanitarium. And finally, we will have Fabio Forgione, who is head of mission for MSF in Iraq. And he will, will be raising the issue of the lack of access to medical care in Iraq and many parts of the world 
because of growing disrespect for the medical staff and medical mission. So, Jiangye, from the perspective of Islamic relief, could you please share with us your questions on the issue of the, the tension between the growing diversity of actors and the need to ensure respect for the humanitarian principles? Okay, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we do. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I must congratulate ICRC on its 150th anniversary and for hosting such a pertinent uh, live discussion and topic on the ethics and politics of humanitarian action. Uh, I was very much touched by the previous uh, uh, speaker's comments, uh, and if I can touch upon those in the sense that uh, of trust building, of matching the needs, and uh, having to speak to those uh, irrespective of what side of the uh, political problem or persuasion that they, they sit. And as a humanitarian agency that is deeply ingrained and entrenched in the humanitarian action, um, most recently in Somalia, in South Central Somalia, where I personally visited on more than one occasion where our teams are operating on the ground, um, we tried our level best both in Somalia and in Afghanistan and in all the conflicts of the last decade or so to not determine who are the good beneficiaries and who are the bad beneficiaries, who are the ones that we can have partnerships with and who are the ones that we can work with. The war on terror, as it were, since, I mean, it's, it's quite poignant that we are now uh, commemorating 9-11, uh, but 12, 13 years late, 12 years later, we look at the world in which that we're operating in with an increase in escalation of conflict and insurgency and extremism and all the other um, uh, 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 conflicts that are taking place at this moment in time, and we're finding as a humanitarian agency uh, struggling to ensure that we meet the uh, impartial, impartiality and neutrality while maintaining focus on our core goals of reaching those in need. We must keep in mind how can we imagine for the future with the changing dynamics of humanitarian action with the partners that are emerging, especially from the Gulf, as I've experienced and witnessed in partnership with the OIC, with the Gulf countries in, a, in a recent uh, times of Somalia, how can we imagine collectively new major players arriving on the scene, partnerships with actors who sympathize with the beneficiaries, sympathize with the beneficiaries, concerns without violating humanitarian principles and laws um, that are, have been in place uh, for decades. So my question is, how do we uh, collectively build new partnerships with actors who sympathize with beneficiaries and concerns without violating humanitarian principles? Thank you, Jean Guy. Uh, thank you very much. Before I bring this question to the panelists, I'd like to immediately give the floor to the, the second uh, field perspective this evening. So I now turn to Patrick Vial. Uh, Patrick uh, is head of delegation for Somalia. He's also a veteran of humanitarian action because he worked in MSF and in ICRC in various contexts such as Sierra Leone, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan or, or Sudan. So please, Patrick, would you like to, to join me here? Thank you. So. The question here we want to discuss is the question of, of perception, acceptance, and access. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ask a question. I'm going to try to describe some dilemma that we are facing in the field. And when I prepared my uh, uh, very brief intervention, because I've been asked to be brief, I didn't think, I did not anticipate that it would uh, echo so much uh, issues and problems that had been raised by the panelists. But uh, I think it all comes well together in the end. Um, it's all about uh, challenges to perception and uh, acceptance but in, in, in conflict situation, but in a conflict situation where we also have uh, a lot of efforts deployed in, uh, in uh, building the state or helping rebuild the state. Uh, this is the context of Somalia, but I really strongly believe that uh, the context in which we work in Somalia in many ways resembles quite a lot uh, other uh, contexts where ICRC and many other actors operate. Um, to illustrate these challenges, um, let me first try to set the scene uh, of this context. 
uh, and uh, forgive me if uh, it's, it lacks a bit of nuances in its uh, description, for, just for the sake of uh, uh, being concise. Um, in Somalia, uh, on the context of Somalia, there is a very large consensus within the international community about three broad objectives. The first one is to uh, defeat the, um, the armed opposition. Uh, the second is to help rebuild the state. And the third is to uh, address the uh, humanitarian and development needs in, in the country. To pursue these objectives, uh, the United Nations Security Council has opted for a, a formula of uh, a structurally integrated mission, uh, which, which um, combines three functions, political, military, humanitarian, um, that should work in a coordinated fashion and under the same leadership. In parallel to this, we also have a set of humanitarian actors, uh, and I'm not sure we should call them humanitarian actors, uh, who uh, act uh, as vectors of the bilateral aid of their respective government, of where they come from, to the government of Somalia. We are therefore here confronted to a situation that you have described already and that we all know too well, uh, where the line between political and humanitarian objectives is becoming very much blurred and where the strengths and perhaps also the credibility of humanitarian principles is being diluted, diluted by uh, you know, too frequent invocation uh, by actors who do not really apply them, as you mentioned, Mr. Commissioner. So I don't think it should come as a surprise to all of us, uh, humanitarian actors in Somalia, that uh, the, the armed opposition has grown uh, increasingly suspicious uh, about uh, the true intent of humanitarian organizations. And that has a, a consequence for us. We need to be extremely attentive to the way our actions uh, are being perceived. The risk of not being sufficiently attentive is to, um, to lose the acceptance uh, that we may eventually benefit from, to lose, therefore, access to a population that are in desperate need of assistance, and, and there are many uh, such populations in, in South Central Somalia, uh, as, uh, as our colleague from Islamic, Islamic Relief has, uh, has already highlighted. But worse, we can also we, we, we risk becoming target of attacks as well, because considered as uh, too close to the government, not being true to uh, the humanitarian uh, principles. Yet, the role of the ICRC, and I believe also some uh, other, some intergovernmental uh, humanitarian organizations, is not only to assist uh, victims of conflict, direct assistance, I mean. It's also to engage with an, a, a large number of actors. Um, uh, government actors, national authorities, but also international authorities, to try to achieve these objectives. And we call those you know, mostly protection and prevention objectives. For the ICRC, it's, it's about uh, promoting the, uh, a better knowledge, uh, but especially a respect of international humanitarian law. This is really at the heart of uh, our mission. Um, and that can translate into the training uh, of military, arm, military and security forces. For UNHCR, it can translate into uh, encouraging and uh, helping the government to come up with some policies and, and, uh, and, and legal framework uh, to better manage and care for refugees. What I want to highlight here is the, um, the difficulty of carrying out these activities in such a polarized environment. Um, uh, doing so, engaging frequently with, with the authorities, uh, is, uh, might be perceived as uh, uh, being part and parcel of the international support to the government and therefore have very serious negative consequences. Um, the ultimate risk uh, for humanitarian organizations in this particular uh, context and, and others which have the same, the same uh, conditions is to become important in the end. Impo important because uh, we would suffer from a very uh, dramatic, uh, dramatically reduced capacity on the one hand to uh, reach out and assist people who, uh, people who need it badly uh, and on the other hand 
to uh, fulfill our uh, protection and prevention objectives by engaging with these uh, authorities because of the physical danger that proximity to these authorities can involve. So I've tried here to just you know, uh, um, describe some of the dilemma and, and difficulties, uh, basically the fine line we have to walk uh, in, in such a context, which uh, I think resonates a lot with what you have already expressed, uh, members of the panel, uh, but I wish stop here, short of making further conclusions and, and recommendations, because I think you are better qualified than me for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. I suggest now we, we move to the third intervention from the field. So I realize that we have not been able to establish the connection with Iraq. Um, so we have, yes, we, we have uh, fortunately asked Fabio, the head of MSF Iraq, to record this question first because we, we anticipated that we could have problems. So I suggest now we, we watch his intervention. Thank you very much for having me today uh, at this conference. Uh, my intervention um, comes within a context in which MSF is about to launch the uh, medical care and the fight projects, which is a project expected to uh, shed lights and report and expose the scale and the consequences that in many countries in which we work, uh, healthcare is, um, is facing. Uh, today, it's becoming more and more difficult, particularly in war torn um, areas, to, to make sure that uh, healthcare uh, is provided uh, impartially and um, unconditionally. Um, what, because medical personnel, patients and health structures, health structures as such are more and more uh, under threat of violence, uh, of acts of retaliation which are perpetrated by belligerents, by armed groups or by the same uh, military forces which are active within a conflict taking place in that specific country. Um, as far as my experience is concerned, um, it, Iraq and Lebanon, which are the two countries in which I've been working uh, in the last few years uh, with MSF, um, I can see how um, such trends are, are very much in place. We are supporting hospitals uh, and other structures in, um, in Tripoli, north of Lebanon, as well as in Awija and in Kirkuk in Iraq. Um, and a quite common situation where medical personnel um, doesn't feel safe to to, to, uh, to address medical issues and to, and to practice medicine in, um, in, uh, in health structures and as well as patients uh, can, uh, don't really have the possibilities to have full and neutral access to, uh, to health care. Uh, emergency departments as well as ambulances are in fact targeted and sometimes we have situations where it's extremely difficult, it is not impossible to refer a patient, although critically injured from one hospital to another, due to the presence of um, front lines which are uh, existing between one hospital and the other and makes th therefore uh, impossible or at least delays the, 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 the needed medical treatments which war wounded might uh, present in certain circumstances. Uh, and today as a medical or organization working in, uh, in emergency situation we, we see cases where uh, basically uh, is accepted uh, or at least is tolerated by national authorities, by national parties the fact that access to health care is not as impartial and uh, unconditional as it should be. Uh, and this is one of the main issues which today we are actually addressing as, uh, as MSF. Uh, based on that it comes my, uh, my questions to, to the panelists, which is um, uh, how uh, ourselves as a, a medical humanitarian organization, but even um, you as a, a main representative of the international community at its best, um, should address basically the issue of the medical practice uh, when it, it seems to be part of a wider uh, military or political strategy and uh, what's your view therefore um, on uh, um, uh, medical practice and when basically is um, affected by violence as we see happening more and more in conflict situations. Well, thank you very much. So. Um the good news 
is that we have more time. As we started late this conference, I suggest we move to 7.20 and can have more time for discussion and questions. Let me simply um, uh, rephrase or repeat what Jean Gear said. How do we ensure a collective strategic approach, approach but with enough autonomy for local, local actors and their specificities? We then add the point by Patrick on the tension between the need for humanitarian actors to secure access versus the risk of being seen as part of a larger state or peace-building international agenda by armed groups. And finally, the point raised by Fabio, how can the international community better act to make sure that the very basic norms such as provision of medical care is better respected? So these are three questions to the panel. Uh, but I would suggest that without waiting, we can also add a few more questions from, from the floor. So we would like to, to raise a question to our yes, panelists. No problem. No. Not yet, so take your time. Oh, please, <laughs> President Samauga. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je vous dis merci, uh, uh, Madame uh, la Commissaire européenne, uh, Monsieur le Haut Commissaire, Monsieur le Président du CICR, Docteur Capilla. Je le dis en français parce que je crois que le français est encore une langue officielle du CICR. But let me come uh, to what uh, you uh, were discussing, congratulating you. Uh, I think that in front of these uh, tremendous challenges that you have described. Uh, there were three uh, points that uh, impressed me a lot. Uh, uh, the point on professionalism, the point on courage, and the point of partnership. Now, uh, I did perhaps miss something, but uh, Dr. Capilla, professor now, but I knew him, doctor, a <laughs> tough negotiator when he was in defeat. Good that uh, Claire Short uh, was more open mind that, that him <laughs> to help us. <laughs> now, uh, if, there is always time for payback. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like simply to say he uh, made this uh, link uh, referring to Henri Dunant between uh, politics and humanitarian and humanitarian and politics. And he developed that. And I think that in between, there is an extraordinary tool that has to be used, these are international humanitarian law, the Geneva Conventions, particularly with uh, two uh, provisions that I would like to recall. In Article 1, uh, common, this uh, fact to respect and ensure respect. This is something that has to be addressed to all parties of the Geneva Convention. And then Article 3, that uh, refers to all sorts of uh, violence, the mini convention. I think uh, that this is something that should be constantly used. Probably you will feel, as I also felt in the past, that uh, it doesn't show immediate results. But my principle was always gutta cavat lapidem. Uh, and you have to repeat that, repeat that always up to the time when there is an improvement. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Président Samaruga. On parle toujours le français et même le latin au CICR. Um, so, um, before I take another question, maybe I turn to the panelists. Would like to answer one of these um, comments or, or questions? Any of you? Well, I mean, uh, firstly, I'm, I'm, uh, I hope I, I was successful in provoking you, Peter, and others. Um, I think not too much. Not too much. Well, we'll try now. <laughs> you know, when I listened to our friends uh, on uh, uh, the, our three friends who intervened, the cri de coeur was about the loss of humanitarian space. And, you know, if humanitarians are working so efficiently and effectively, according to the humanitarian principles, as we all are and should, why are we not succeeding? So to me, this is a paradox. In fact, do, do you see what the, the point I'm trying to make is? It may well be that it is because we are, our humanitarian values and 
values are separate. I imagine principles in operational terms are not keeping pace with a changing world. That's why, Peter, I think a model that might have worked well for the last 150 years, is it likely to work well for the next 150 years? When the next 150 years are very different, the present is very different to the past, let alone the future. So what I would say is not to, that, uh, that we should all become politicians and become um, uh, partial and, uh, you know, no one is arguing that we should not be uh, anything other than neutral in, and impartial when it comes to helping humanity suffering. But I'm raising the question that clearly humanitarian space is being constricted more and more. So transaction costs of doing humanitarian business is increasing. And I'd love as an academic to do some research which show whether or not today's humanitarian space is actually more or less compared to, say, a generation ago or a decade, a decade ago. So I would answer my, my, my friends in Iraq and elsewhere by simply saying that uh, I think you need to consider becoming politicians, not, becoming po not politicians in the partisan sense of compromising your humanitarian principles or, uh, or, or that, but in a sense thinking politically, how, why is it that people attack ambulances? I mean, when you get to the stage of people attacking ambulances and healthcare facilities and doctors and so on, you really know you have got problems. There you've gone to the very bottom, if you like, of our humanitarian endeavor. So for me, I ask for, I ask for some kind of humility within the humanitarian enterprise. And don't stick kind of in a jealously guarded way without even discussing it. That maybe our impartiality and neutrality may have to be paralleled with some other things to do so we can rebuild the trust that allowed us to be able to have that access, which are, is more and more and more and more and more being, being restricted. I have no problem with humility. I haven't uh, problems with what you say, Mukesh. I, uh, I do believe that we have overestimated the consensus on principles, that this consensus is not there, mm -hmm. that we have underestimated uh, the, uh, uh, the energy and time it needs to re-establish a consensus. I'm deeply convinced that this will not happen through abstract discussion on principles or proliferation of commitments, but through concrete action. Uh, that's where I do believe that while I do not want to immunitize Whatever experiences we made, there are important experiences in the past that we make which may even be valid in the future. Because trying to build up consensus on the ground on what action is possible with all actors and reaching out to them and creating the space to do humanitarian work is, in, is, is critically important. Uh, and in that sense, I think I, I strongly agree with, with your approach and I don't find ICRC in fundamental contradiction, but rather uh, in sync with, uh, with uh, some of what you say. I think we, uh, we, we have indeed to be careful. And for instance, uh, the, uh, the medical example in the last intervention is, is an important one. I mean, we put this to the policy debate in the international arena, the healthcare in danger. We, we started an initiative trying to build facts together and, and see where principles are critically questions through action or non-respect in concrete situations. And I, I do agree that we have to have a debate and advocacy and debate on why we are in the situation that we are is important. Mukesh, maybe my last point would be, I'm still on one point a little bit skeptical before you have done your research on whether the situation is worse, better uh, or equal to 10, 20 or 30 years ago. I simply, I think we don't know. Mm. If I look and try to do a photography of what we encounter at the present moment, it's not all bad in terms of respect of principles and access and the chances through negotiation with all groups and trying to be close to needs of people to have more access today than less access. And I, I bring the example again of the north of Mali. Uh, 
when we started negotiations with the Mujahon, the AD, everybody thought that we would never achieve to have their consent for a neutral and impartial activity in the north of Mali. And six weeks later, it was possible to have their consensus to deploy an operation which has fed 500,000 people and uh, provided medical aid to, uh, to the population in the north of Mali. So it is possible through mm -hmm. some of the engagements on principles where you do not preach principles, but you try to put them in action and you try to negotiate consensus with those who have, po have power on the ground, it is possible to enlarge the surface of operations. And I think this is w what I wanted to, to illustrate, not to, again, immunitize or doctrinize a practice of 150 years, but to say a couple of things we have learned, and some of them are even functioning today. Um, Mr. High Commissioner? No, I would like to just make a few comments. First, in political terms, what matters is not what it is. It was what matters is what it is perceived as being. <laughs> uh, and that is, I mean, Salazar used to say, in politics, what seems to be, it is. <laughs> uh, and he was a dictator with uh, some success in my country, lasted for 48 years. Uh, and the question of perceptions is here, I think, a crucial question. And indeed, in many of the environments where we act, uh, we are perceived, before doing anything, we are perceived to be instruments of some of the key political actors that mm. are engaged in, mm. in a conflict. And this is a very dramatic situation, especially if you are a UN agency and you are involved, for instance, with a peacekeeping force where there is no peace to keep, and the peacekeeping force is doing its job uh, 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 clearly uh, being a party to the conflict. And so uh, there are a certain number of situations in which uh, what we do is perceived by some actors as being an action of the enemy and at the service of the enemy. That is why I am so, uh, inside the UN, I am so careful about the drive towards structural integration so much in favor of uh, strategic integration, but so reluctant in uh, conflict areas where uh, there is a political dimension that, or a military dimension, uh, uh, very reluctant about uh, structural integration. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, what it is also clear for me is that the best protection that we have is not through hardware, is not through uh, uh, militarized support. The best protection is the capacity to engage with communities. Uh, and if we engage effectively with communities, even some rogue actors will be more careful in attacking us. But having said so, we are also facing a number of situations in which some of those actors indeed consider any kind of humanitarian action as something that needs to be uh, fought. And then we have a growing banditism. And for the banditism, I mean, an ambulance is uh, uh, something to be looted like anything else. So uh, this creates a real contradiction. I think we need to be humble enough to recognize that in some situations um, uh, we face a contradiction. Because against banditism, we need some kind of protection from the armed actors that are uh, on the ground. But that protection creates a problem in relation to our action. Mm. And that is why we are facing situations in which the problem is to, the, to, to, to know whether we can or we cannot go on operating in those scenarios. And this is a dramatic choice mm -hmm. because obviously to decide to leave is to decide also to leave the people we care for. So, uh, but there are no easy solutions. I mean, uh, I think that we need to recognize that there are real contradictions mm -hmm. and real moments in which I feel perplexed about what to do in my organization in some of the problems we face in some of the countries where we operate. Um, and the question of the risks of our staff versus uh, the, uh, the need uh, that, that you mentioned to, to deliver to the people that is suffering even more. Uh, so uh, there are no easy solutions for these things. When problems are complex, uh, my uh, guess is that the best way is to stick to principle. Uh, when problems get too complicated, I think the best is to 
to have a simplistic approach of sticking to principles. And so I would say the moment when you will not be able to act with impartiality in a scenario, better leave the scenario. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Which, of course, is a political decision. Mm -hmm. yep. That's an interesting point, uh, <laughs> Antonio, yes. Uh, I, I'm just reflecting as you speak. And uh, I think it would be interesting to imagine some of the situations and to discuss together whether you would leave here or whether uh, we would stay or not. Mm. I mean, it's interesting because Kristalina a little bit further on uh, mentioned, and I agree fully with Antonia, it's a political decision at the end of the day. Uh, but Kristalina praised our being present where, where others are not. Uh, this is exactly the borderline that we have to take. Uh, normally, indeed, we try another additional round when the situation seems helpless. And, and try uh, another round putting the needs of people first and try to, to give it one more chance of success. But... Uh, we are confronted exactly with the situation that uh, you, you described, Antonio, uh, also at ICRC. And, and I said in, in, in the discussion previously this afternoon with Kristalina, this is almost like pre-Solferino situations mm -hmm. which we are confronted in some of the theatres of conflict today, mm -hmm. where actors behave as if principles would not yet be there and have been declared politically. They are in existence. And this brings us in, in very difficult choices between nevertheless trying to mount an operation which is maybe not in sync with the doctrine and the principles and, and helping people who are there <coughs> and who need to be helped. Um, in my, my, my reflection on the questions um, and, and what my friends here say is threefold. First, we have to accept that there is a degree of wishful thinking that unfortunately corresponds to the saying the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, and I would not be shy to say that the Somalia decision may very well fall in this category. Many of us in the humanitarian community were saying, you know, don't, don't rush into an integrated mission. Let's give some time to see how, how conditions go. We were unsuccessful in making uh, the case. And, and by the way, if you have time, we can go into the reasons. I mean, there are actually some reasons of our own making that led some people to pressure for integrated missions because there is a perception that the, uh, many, many of the uh, uh, humanitarians have been in uh, Nairobi for a long time, living the good life uh, uh, on, on, on the back of the Somalia crisis. So it's complicated but the bottom line here they is still that there with the integrated mission well even even <laughs> even even basically so we went into wishful thinking to resolve a problem that we didn't even resolve huh? and and resolve not the right problem because you know who cares what cares is what matters is is are are people getting help uh, in the country and that so the the phenomenon of wishful uh, thinking I'm not necessarily is bad to have aspirations that things are better than they are. But we have to have a, and this is where our in but out comes, we have to have a seat uh, at the table in the right moment and actually speak up and have the, the, the arguments. Uh, in this case, it was a little bit the humanitarians uh, running after a train that has left the station. And uh, uh, my only wisdom here would be that, that it is a decision that is worth revisiting, given circumstances as they are. Uh, 
uh, but not pointing fingers, just saying, look, let's, let's, let's see whether we, we have not rushed a little bit, jumped our gun. Of course, you have a government in Somalia that is also in the planet, on the planet of wishful thinking. They want their country to be peaceful and... Uh, so their, their talk goes a little bit ahead of, 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 of reality. So this is one reflection, the honest discussion. That takes me to my second point. To have an honest discussion among people who may, may have different views and may even have to talk and then agree to disagree. We have to accept this in but out. We have to talk to each other uh, more. And here, if I have one criticism to, towards the humanitarian uh, community in a very constructive manner, is that sometimes we are sitting <coughs> on our high horse morally, and we look down at the other people. Uh, we kind of go poo-poo of these politicians. Uh, but the world is so complex, and actually that is my second point, fragmentation. We cannot afford to have development, the development community, the humanitarian community, uh, politicians, to be fragmented because what we face is a universe of around maybe 30-ish countries that are either in a conflict or coming out of a conflict or, or, or slipping into, into a conflict. And what makes it even worse, two-thirds to three-quarters of these countries are also very vulnerable to natural disasters and they have, section, have exceptionally high population uh, growth. So to, to, make, to make more, to be able to, to more look from different perspectives at a problem and unite on these countries. I frankly think that, that the world cannot afford to have failed states. We see it in Somalia. I mean, whenever it happens, we see the price we pay. And yet, we are kind of sleepwalking into, we, are sleep, we have sl we've been sleepwalking into the Syria crisis. And now we have Syria as a failed state, huh? so with the implications for the whole region. So my, my plea, I guess, would be that we do have to, to bring more coherence, more consistency to work uh, together uh, more. But I also would come, in, this is my last, last third, last point, I also would come very strongly on defending mandate and defending the principles because we should collaborate but from the perspective of our comparative strength, what we bring. What we bring is actually neutrality, impartiality, and independence. I remember this good man next to me who outranks me as a high commissioner and me, a mere commissioner, <laughs> going to Yemen. And because we came as non-politicals, as humanitarians, <coughs> I mean, we are there to help people. After a lot of wrangling, we negotiated to go into Houthi territory and sit in a room with the Houthi commanders with their Kalashnikovs on one side and Antonio and me, exactly like this. This was our weapon with our smiles on the other side. We negotiated access for ICRC, <laughs> protection for ICRC and, and other humanitarian organizations, and non-interference in distribution of humanitarian aid. And then we got the fax signed, and it kind of still holds, not maybe entirely, but it still holds. Would have not been possible if we did not have the principles to stand on. So they really are our contribution in this complex world. And I think we must value, value them, not be blind for other considerations, not be blind for political considerations. Sometimes uh, my, own, my own team, you know, it's like their political antennas are cut down to zero. We have to be open that there is political reality, but we bring our contribution is, is this, that we stand up for the most vulnerable people on the principles we have. And we need to reach out. There was a question on, you know, how you bring other actors. We need to reach out uh, to, to them. I, I, I strongly believe we need to reach out to the, to the Arab uh, world and build this common understanding that 
We need solidarity in the future. We need it also for our children. What is to guarantee that there would be no catastrophe somewhere in Europe that calls for solidarity? When I went to Japan after Fukushima, that was the big thing that hit me, that we are all vulnerable. And that solidarity is a value that, that, that we have to nurture for, also for our own, own uh, self-interest. Self uh, so I, I, I think we have to be proud of what the community is, push the community to, to be more inclusive, huh? deal with the fragmentation, and also to the, to the words that you said, professionalism, courage. I also, actually, a partnership, I would add honesty. <laughs> huh? So we can deal with the wishful thinking uh, uh, better. Well, thank you all very much. It's very difficult for me because now I have to close this discussion because the time is up. And uh, I feel very, um, still very hungry. And uh, I know that uh, many questions could have been raised and, and many questions also from, from the public or from people watching us online. So I'd like to thank you all. Thank the people who watched us online. I won't try to uh, capture everything which has been discussed, but I hope you felt the same way as I did in feeling the energy uh, the commitment, um, the, the appetite for solutions. I didn't see any old-fashioned person on this panel, uh, so I'd like to thank you for that. And please join me in thanking you, in thanking the, our, our four guests tonight. Thank you. Dear guests, I knew that my emotion was well placed when I welcomed you at the start of the evening. Indeed, today's panel discussion has illustrated that the ambition that was announced for the humanitarian is becoming a reality. It is my honor to welcome you to the cocktail reception hosted by the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the ICRC. I wish you a pleasant networking evening and hope to meet again.